Okay, are you guys ready for chapter 15? It's called shooting. Chapter 15, shooting. The next morning when Durkian awoke, his whole body ached and his feet were sore and swollen. He sighed when he thought of the long walk ahead of him. But when he went into the kitchen, where the five pale Van Manen children were happily consuming the rest of Durkian's bread and the rest of his milk, Mrs. Van Manen had good news for him. Mr. Garretts is driving his truck to Utrecht today, she said. It will have some cargo, but there is room for passengers. I managed to get a seat for you. He knows your uncle. Oh, thank you very much, said Durkian fervently. The truck was probably one of those that supplied the German army with food. How is Everett, he asked. Oh, he is still very weak, said Mrs. Van Manen. Some of our group are going to The Hague, and I hope that they will take care of Everett and his cart. I wouldn't like him to make that journey alone. No, agreed Dirk Jan, eating his bread and drinking his watered milk with a better conscience now that he knew Everett would be looked after too. Dirk Jan had to be at the Morse single at a certain corner to get into the truck. A lot of women were waiting there in a queue, all hoping for a place. They carried the usual bags and baskets. It did not look as if Dirk Jan would have much of a chance at a seat. The women were jabbering away. I tell you, said a thin, angular spinster with the pointed nose, it's a matter of character. I'm the youngest of six. The others are all married, so I will take care of father. Ninety he is, and you should see his clothes. There's not a spot on them. I tell you, it's not easy to keep him clean without soap and the way things are but it's a matter of character. Oh, that's wonderful, such devotion, cried the women around. And an old lady said, you've earned your place in heaven. But the sharp-nosed spinster shrugged her shoulders. It's a matter of character, she insisted. As for the place in heaven, it will have to wait. When the truck arrived, Dirk Jan saw that it was being stoked with wood and charcoal. There was a stove at the back blocking half the door and fuel was stacked inside the truck. Okay, so I don't know if you guys know this, but back in that time, like there were certain vehicles that literally just, you know, you've seen like think about locomotives and trains. Well, there were trucks that actually ran on, like they would have wood stoves or the charcoal or what have you. And that's how they would fuel. Because think about it back then, like during war times, petrol fuel was hard to come by. So there were other ways of figuring vehicles out. And uh, anyways, I think that's kind of interesting. So the women all began to push and fight to get in. Dirk Jan stood aside, unwilling to enter the fray. Then the driver beckoned him. Are you the boy, boy Mrs. Van Menen was telling me about? He asked. You look like your uncle. So I guessed as much. Come on up in the driver's seat and keep me company. Dirk Jan was delighted. Instead of sitting in the stuffy van squashed among bales and boxes and wide skirted women, he would sit comfortably on a seat with a grand view of the road. Behind him, there was a stumbling and shrieking as the women crowded together to make more room. In the end, a little girl of about 10 was left out. The last inch of available space had been filled. She stood stolidly on the curb wrapped in a black shawl, her round face blank with resignation. It was too old an expression for such a child, thought Mr. Garrett. Hop in, he invited, lifting her into the driver's seat beside Dirk Jan. She did not smile, but when Dirk Jan asked her name, she said, Alida. She showed no further inclination to speak. The doors behind it closed, and Mr. Garrett jumped into his place. With a great deal of noise, the truck started. At the gates of the city, the driver had to show his papers to the guard. Then he was waved on, but the guard added a word of warning. The skies are alive today. Look out. He was a patriotic Dutch guard. He winked and put up his fingers in the V sign. The driver winked back and did the same. Then he started the motor again. It's a pity that Arnhem, the Arnhem coup failed, he said to Dirk Jan. We'll have to be, we will have been well out of our misery now if that had succeeded. He sighed. What I miss myself most are cigarettes. He confessed. I'd give my fortune for a good smoke. Dirk Jan's face lit up. He'd been wondering how to repay Mr. Garrett's for his kindness, and now he knew. I have something for you, he said. I just got a present of it today. And he fished the cigarette the German soldier had given him out of his pocket. Mr. Garrett's was incredulous. He stopped the truck, took the cigarette with reverent fingers, sniffed at it, and shut his eyes. Real tobacco, he sighed. 
Then he wrapped it carefully in his handkerchief. I'll smoke that on Sunday, he said, after church. And boy, am I looking forward to it. He started the truck again. So you guys have to ask your parents about smoking back then and smoking just all of that. But I, let's just say that I wouldn't be looking at it like a treat at this point. It's like, no. Anyways, so in my eye is itchy. Sorry, guys. There. Real tobacco, he sighed. Okay, we already read that part. See, I get distracted. There you go. Airplanes were circling the sky. Sometimes they flew low. There was shooting in the distance. Dirk Jan flushed with excitement. Maybe something interesting would happen at last. The truck roared on, eating up the miles, which had dragged so interminably that day before. Now and again, the driver stopped to refuel or clean the spark plugs. The women in the truck were singing folk songs and popular tunes. Dirk Jan felt proud of his country and his people. These were dark days, and the passengers in this truck were all women who'd probably not eaten a decent meal in months, always giving the best to the men and the children. He knew there was nothing to look forward to except more misery, and yet they sang. That's what Holland was like. The Germans would never get her down. It was like the 80-year war with Spain. The Dutch had not changed. They'd, they'd fight for another 80 years if they had to, and then he, Dirk Jan, would have a chance to do his bit. In his imagination, he was running around with a machine gun, spraying bullets into the enemy when a noise ahead attracted his attention. A German military lorry drove in front of them. There seemed to be something wrong with its engine. It was backfiring and it was not going very fast. Mr. Garrett slowed down a bit. Who knows who's in there, he said bitterly. Probably some young Dutch boys being deported to Germany for hard labor. Then something happened. There was a loud roaring overhead and three English planes appeared with dizzying speed. Mr. Garrett's applied the brakes so suddenly that his truck stopped with screeching tires. We'd better put distance between ourselves and that lorry, he said grimly. It seems to be a target. The lorry accelerated and was racing off belching, belching clouds of exhaust. The plane swooped low, almost touching the lorry, and started to fire bullets at it. The lorry lurched and swayed but continued on. The planes had mounted and were circling the sky. Then they dove again, spattering bullets at the lorry. This time a tire exploded. The lorry careened drunkenly and landed with two wheels in the ditch. Again, the planes mounted and again, they came swooping back. The doors of the lorry had burst open and men were jumping out of it and running for cover, diving into shrubbery or behind dikes. Dirk Jan and Mr. Garretts cheered. Mr. Garretts was bent over his steering wheel, shouting with excitement. They're getting away. They're escaping. Now German guards were jumping out of the lorry in pursuit of the prisoners, but their chase was interrupted by the return of the airplanes, which began to shoot at them. Several guards fell down, hit. The others crawled under the lorry. The airplanes mounted again, but returned in double quick time. The lorry was now in flames and the Germans had to crawl out from under it. Meanwhile, the prisoners were scattering far and wide, running from farmhouses, corpses, anything that promised shelter. One was running straight toward Mr. Garrett's truck. The airplanes had vanished. They had done their work. I'm gonna show you guys a picture of the scene, if you guys look in the back, again, don't forget it's going to get bright for just, actually not too bad, maybe the black background helps. You guys see that and notice in the background, the guys in the lorry and it's on fire. So lorry being, you know, like a truck, like a, like a little semi truck kind of thing. There we go. We must help this fellow, said Mr. Garrett, starting his truck. The fugitive was, gasping, fugitive was gasping for breath. The German soldiers were busy, or the German guards were busy with their wounded. Mr. Garrett stopped and opened the door of the driver's seat. Here, he said. The man hopped in. Beads of sweat were dripping down his face. Take the girl on your knees, said Mr. Garrett, and put on my cap. Hide behind the girl as much as you can. Little Adelita did not mind. She was a war child, and the most extraordinary things could happen without surprising her. It was a tight squeeze in the front seat. Dirk Jan had to sit on the edge of it and take care he was not in the driver's way. Now the truck had passed the wreck, had to pass the wreckage of the lorry. The German guards would undoubtedly stop and requisition the truck for their wounded. One of the guards already stood in the middle of the road, signaling Mr. Garrett's to stop. 
Uh oh, Mr. Garrett's wanted to make a spurt for it, so he decided on a ruse. He began to slow down, obviously, until he could reach the guard who stepped aside, convinced that the truck would stop. As soon as he was out of the way, Mr. Garrett stepped on the accelerator and the truck leaped forward like an exploding shell. The guard was too taken aback even to shoot, and the truck sped past the flaming lorry and on along the road, which was bare of people, everyone having fled the bullets. The escaped prisoner breathed easily again. Thanks, he said, taking off his glasses and wiping them on Adelita's hair. That was a narrow squeak. He was a lean man with a pale face who looked as if all he could do was read books. He was not the sort of person Dirk Jan most admired, but he was an escaped prisoner, which was interesting in itself. What are you going to do? asked Dirk Jan. The fugitive smiled, and now Dirk Jan liked him. I haven't the faintest, he said. This was unpremeditated. The truck is going to Utrecht, and you are welcome to come along, the driver told him. No, that won't do. I live in Utrecht, said the young man. They ca they'd capture me again. I should have gone into hiding before, but I was interested in my work. Are you a student? Asked Mr. Garretts. Yes, at the University of Utrecht. Doing my thesis, said the young man, frowning. Would have, would have had it finished if the Nazis hadn't interrupted me. Your parents must be worried, commented Mr. Garretts. Of course they are. They live in Prince, Hendrick Street, 14, and I'd be very obliged if you would send them a message to say that I've escaped, said the young man. But what will I say you're doing, asked Mr. Bar Garretts. I'll be looking for a hiding place, a place where I can go on studying, said the student, who seemed to Dirk Jan the sort of person who didn't let anything distract him from his main purpose who'd continue to study on an iceberg after a ship was wrecked. He'd probably be a professor one day. Then an idea came to Dirk Jan. Why don't you come with me, he said. We live in a mill. It's as quiet there as anywhere in Holland, and we have underdivers already, so it doesn't make any difference to our safety. My father and mother are great patriots, he added proudly. My uncle works in the underground. The student gave him a thoughtful look. He had mild, intelligent, hazel eyes. Are you sure? He asked. Positive, said Dirk Jan. And you'd better make up your mind because we're almost at Satterwood, where I get off. Well, thanks very much then. I will, said the student gratefully. And that's how Hildebrand came to the mill. Okay, that, my dears, is the end of chapter 15, shooting. So now you know why it was called shooting, right? With all that crazy shooting going on. Anyways, that's chapter 15. The next one is chapter 16, the weapon dropping. Because remember what his message was about was weapon dropping. So now we're going to see what happened. So love you guys and I'll see you next time.